Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. I'm Martha Scarborough. I am the Regional Resource Director for Karen Treatment Centers in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation on recovery, relapse, and realignment, how to recognize the reoccurrence of substance use disorder in women. We are gonna be conducting this series in webinar format. So everyone's microphones, they're muted. During the presentation, you're welcome to use the Q&A feature to ask any questions that you might have. And depending on the volume of questions, if we can't get to your question before the end, we will have someone from our team follow up with you directly. Also, please note that part of today's presentation we will be playing recordings of a case vignette. So these recordings do not depict an actual patient or treatment experience. They're only being used to supplement in today's presentation. And today's presentation is eligible for one continuing education credit from the American Psychological Association. We would like to thank our educational sponsor, the CE Learning Systems for their assistance in getting these credits for everyone. In order to get your credit, you must stay on for the duration of the webinar and you will receive a link to complete the eval within a couple of hours from cego.com. Once you complete the evaluation, a certificate will be available to download immediately. And today I am pleased to welcome Erin Goodhart. She is our Senior Clinical Director of Women's Services and the Supervisor of Family Services at Karen Treatment Centers. Erin began her career at Karen in 2004. And since then she's grown her career by working with teens through adults, especially with our female population. In her current role, Erin provides clinical and administrative oversight of much of Karen's programming for women as well as our family services. And some of her specialties include treating trauma in women and families, dialectal, dialectical behavioral therapy, relapse prevention, women's treatment and recovery issues, and the development of clinical staff. In addition to her role at Karen, Erin is an adjunct professor at Alvernia University. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Erin. Erin, thanks so much. Great, thank you, Martha. I'm glad to be here and looking forward to spending this time together. Um, some of our goals for this time together, Kaylin, if you can advance the slide. Thank you. So some of our goals together, um, we're gonna talk about some of the barriers that women face in entering and completing treatment. But if I'm honest, what I really wanna spend the bulk of this time talking about is how the pandemic has impacted, sort of generally, right? But then also how it's really impacted women um, and what relapse uh, treatment looks like um, and how we can sort of look at that through the lens of working more with women as opposed to a kind of global um, you know, discussion about that. And then also looking at some of the things that women really need when they leave treatment and what makes um, aftercare really important in terms of this process. 
So what I'll start with is just sign of some of the barriers that women face when they um, think about coming into treatment. And these have been pretty well discussed um, in some previous webinars, but just want to kind of give a little snapshot um, about what has prevented women from coming into treatment. So the first thing, you know, I always like to start with people either love working with women or they hate working with women. Um, I happen to love having a full unit of women and really seeing them grow and blossom into recovering people. But women come in and they have a lot of fear. And that fear is associated with a, a lot of different things. Um, for a lot of our women who are parents, who are mothers, they're concerned about what's going to happen to my kids. Um, and part of that fear is also what if they're able to survive without me? And so when we even think about parents, women, specifically mothers, coming into treatment right now, one of the things that they've been faced with over the last year is, you know, kind of being that primary point person for virtual learning, for sports, for, you know, virtual, I think about some of the stuff that my kids are doing, virtual Cub Scouts, virtual dance classes, right? They've been that point person. And so allowing themselves to kind of take care of themselves and, and step back from that position of needing to manage it all. Along with that comes shame. Obviously, shame is huge for, you know, most people coming into treatment. But again, especially for women who, you know, have concerns about what they're going to be, how they're going to be viewed as daughters, partners, and mothers. Um, a big one that we hear a lot is that don't get along with women. Um, I think that's something that, you know, most treatment is, you um, gender specific, right, for obvious reasons. And one of the things that they'll say is I don't get along with women. And what I try to help them to understand through this is that we know the research tells us women need connection more than men. They need that emotional, that intimate, it's the way we're hardwired. And so one of the things that we talk about is that, you know, when they leave treatment, they're going to have to have a support system of women in recovery who are going to be able to understand where they're coming from, hold them accountable, and really be a part of that support system for them. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time, you know, talking about the way that the pandemic has also really impacted, um, you know, all of us, right? And so I think we can talk about the epidemic within the pandemic, um, you know, so just some stats that, you know, I think have been really interesting as we look over the last year. Um, you know, so from August 2019 till July 2020, 84,000 people have died um, of drug overdose. That's 23% more than the previous 12-month period. So, you know, you all know as well as I do that this pandemic has really um, put some pretty significant barriers in place in terms of people getting treatment and, and the accountability factors, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, hazardous alcohol use rose 21% to 41% in September. And those with a severe alcohol dependence rose from 4% to 17% in that same time period. So we see that people are um, using substances more frequently, and I have some thoughts about that that I'm going to talk about. And then, you know, I know that previous to kind of coming on this, there were some questions about young people and teens and, and how we're managing this. Um, you know, 63% of young people reported symptoms of anxiety or depression, 25% increase in substance use, and 25% seriously considered suicide. So, you know, we're really dealing with a health crisis, within, uh, a mental health crisis within this health crisis. And, and it's, I think it needs to be noted and we need to be able to acknowledge that people are struggling. When we think about women in specific, um, <clears throat> some of the things that we've noticed over time with women uh, in specific during this pandemic, Caitlin, if you can move to the next slide. Um, you know, there's been a lot of articles coming out about how Women have been stretched too thin um, with little to no support. Uh, there was a recent article in um, the New York Times that talked about, you know, and by this point, I'd say it's probably over a million working mothers left the workplace over the last year. And this is significant because, you know, just as I started off that many women rely and need connection, 
you know, people have left some of those um, workplace connections they had also, and then there's sort of nothing to fill it. You know, there was this article that I was recently reading about this group of mothers that got together and socially distanced in a safe way, and all they did was just, like, scream and just, like, let it out and be with other people who understood, but really being able to let that energy and that anxiety and that fear and all those things kind of out of themselves. Because women have been put in a position to really, you know, hold things together. Um, you know, we've talked pre in previous webinars about, you know, the responsibilities um, more so now than ever with women. Um, and being able to balance being a working parent, um, all of the, you know, school responsibilities, sports responsibilities, home responsibilities. And one of the things that I think has been really interesting for me in working with our women is that, um, many, and, and our patients tell us this, and so some of this is anecdotal, but, you know, they have said to us when the pandemic started and, you know, quarantine and isolation and events stopped, their external control mechanisms were taken away. You know, I have worked with women who, you know, they wouldn't start drinking until after the kids got off the bus, and that was an external control mechanism. They still had all the symptoms, right? They had urgency of first drink. They still ended up not being able to, um, you know, maybe take their kids to soccer practice after school. But that was a way that they controlled their substance use. And then with the kids being home all day, you know, there was sort of no need to worry about getting in the car and driving or how am I going to present for the other parents. So the women have talked about that lack of structure um, allowed them to begin using early on, earlier in the day. The other thing that was really interesting, especially in like April to June, we saw an increase in um, teachers coming into treatment. And again, it was for the same reasons, right? Those external factors that um, once helped them to manage their drinking, you know, one of the things that they were able to manage was not drinking before going into work. And then when they were teaching from home, you know, and trying to navigate that, I mean, I give you know, our educators and, you know, us too, right, therapists, so much credit in such a, a quick shift that had to be made. But they talked about the stress of, um, you know, I remember working with one particular woman, and she talked about the stress of needing to figure out how to navigate an online system, being concerned about her kids, because she knew that sometimes the only place they were getting, you know, a meal and some sort of emotional support was at school. And so really being concerned about those things. And so, you know, needing to manage that adjustment into what the new normal looks like, right? And um, women likely taking on sort of the bulk of those responsibilities. Caitlin, can you go to the next slide? So what we're going to do now is we are going to revisit Amelia. So. Amelia is a, um, you know, some true, some fictional made up pieces of, of a patient um, that we focused on a few webinars ago in terms of women and addiction and recovery. So we're actually going to build on Amelia, but let's just hear a little bit about Amelia's story. Hello, my name is Amelia and this is my story. I come from a small town in New Hampshire where my parents own an engineering firm. Due to the demands of their business, they really weren't around as I was growing up. I was raised by a combination of nannies, caretakers, and private schools. When they were around, my parents did instill in me that no matter what, a perfect appearance and demeanor was of the utmost importance. During my junior year of high school, I experienced a pretty significant sexual trauma, and because of that, I wanted nothing more than to escape from my hometown and leave everything behind. That's why I was thrilled when I was accepted to the University of Charleston. I was highly motivated when I entered college, but after I attended a few parties, I got swept up in the party scene and I got into some trouble. During my freshman year, I met David, who is six years older than me and was on the verge of graduating with his MBA. I guess you could say it was love at first sight because within six months he had proposed. And yes, I was young at the time, but it just felt right. I struggled with my studies as I entered my sophomore year and I dropped out not long after that. David got a great job, so I moved in with him. We got married, and not long after that, I gave birth to our two children, and I had two kids by the time I was 25. As David became more successful, our lifestyle changed even more. We settled into this beautiful home along the Philadelphia Main Line, 
the typical white picket fence neighborhood. We were very close with our neighbors. And just as when I was growing up, appearances were everything. We'd have these lavish block parties and drinking was really a cornerstone to fitting in. Once the children went off to school, I started sinking into a deep depression like I've never felt before. I really lost my sense of purpose, not having the kids around for me to care for all day long. David was working longer hours, and when he was around, he'd make negative comments about my cooking, how I put on extra weight, or he'd just plain ignore me. I befriended a few of the wives in the neighborhood, and we'd have a couple of glasses of wine during the day. One of them turned me on to cocaine when I mentioned that I was having trouble taking off some of the baby weight that I still had hanging around my midsection. I loved how it made me feel, and I continued to use it whenever I had the chance. I got on board with the personal trainer who helped me create this strict dietary regimen of 800 calories or less per day. Between the cocaine, exercising, and the diet, I was in incredible shape, but I kept fainting. I spent a lot of time in boutiques when I wasn't working out, trying to find these great outfits to impress my husband. Um, But during a couple of these store visits, I actually passed out in the dressing room. The store employees were very concerned about me. The boutique purchases I've mostly kept from David. I hide them in closets just to make sure he doesn't know how much money I'm spending. Um, I only wear them once or twice and I go out and buy something else. So with the onset of the pandemic, David has been working from home. At first, it was nice having him around, but lately it's been anything but that. He has been accusing me of watching too much TV and is still very negative about my appearance. And he makes comments about my hair and my makeup and anything really he can generally pick on me for. In late August, when he had fallen asleep, I actually took a look at his phone. I found some DMs from another woman who he had been speaking to for some time saying that he was in the process of getting a divorce and that soon he'll have more time to spend with her. I was afraid to confront him. I didn't want to risk my home, my kids, and this life we built together. So I've been really putting my focus on making sure that the kids are staying on track with their virtual schooling, making sure that there's decent food on the table every night, and just trying to keep up with my diet and exercise. But it's been really hard keeping it together, being at home all the time, and um, not really having a lot of time to myself. This past Halloween, I was getting ready for our block party that we have every Halloween, and David and I got into a pretty bad argument. One thing led to another, and I finally confronted him about the affair. Things turned really bad, and rather than let the children see us fight, I decided to go over to my girlfriend's house. And I decided to use cocaine to numb my anger, and we drank quite a bit because I just didn't want to feel anything. By the time the block party had started, I was stumbling around the neighborhood, and I actually blacked out in my own front yard. I really don't remember much else from that night. That was the point that David decided to call my parents and told them he couldn't handle my behavior anymore and that he wanted a divorce. He's starting to take full custody of the kids unless I get some help. So here we are. So um, just as a revisit on this, um, Amelia did actually, she ended up coming to the Women's Grandview program, um, you know, to address both the co-occurring disorders, um, the process addictions, um, you know, we looked at her trauma history. Um, she was able to receive some trauma treatment and there great feedback. Um, her and David worked really closely with the family therapist and her children attended the children's program. Meditation and spirituality was really important for Amelia as we went through this process with her. So if we continue to follow up with Amelia, um, her aftercare plan, which I know was one of the things that, um, you know, I'd like to focus on sort of after you look at the relapse process, but her recovery plan was weekly meetings with a therapist in her hometown, which she did agree to do. Um, she was going to continue on the trauma work and also have some marriage counseling that her and David did, in fact, um, engage in. She was recommended to continue to work with a nutritionist and personal trainer, which, again, she was willing to do. She was recommended to co- connect with uh, women-specific recovery groups, um, so she was able to engage with some support systems in her area when she returned home. A big part of her plan was engaging in the reco- My First Year Recovery Program, um, which is a program that is very much um, sort of based off of the programs that physicians go into when they get into recovery. So. She was talking with the recovery specialist here every week, and we're actually going to play another recording of her talking with her recovery specialist here. Um, And that includes Soberlink and urine drug screens and contact with the family. So she really had a good solid plan wrapped around her that she was in agreement with when she discharged from our care. So 
So now we're going to revisit with Amelia. So we're a couple months out, and you're going to hear a phone call between her and her recovery care specialist. Hi, Amelia. This is Beth, your recovery specialist from Karen. Is now a good time for our weekly check-in? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. So last week when we spoke, we talked about the success you've been having with your virtual AA meetings and how you're making more progress on the trauma work you started here in treatment with a therapist in your hometown. Uh, I think you told me that things between you and your husband have been going well, especially after attending the couples workshop together last month. Um, I know you said the kids are headed back to in-person learning for the first time since March of last year. Yay! Uh, which you mentioned may be a little challenging for you. I did notice, though, that you haven't logged in to the In Recovery app to complete your assignments. And I also don't have any results from your SoberLink device this week. Is everything okay? It's been a difficult week. I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on? Well... David left two nights ago for another unscheduled work trip. Apparently, he's going to seal the deal with a client in Utah and had to go in person. He won't be back until the weekend. We got into a pretty big fight when he left, and we haven't spoken since. I just can't shake the feeling that he's still having an affair. The kids are back in school, and they were what was really keeping me going with playing teacher and keeping them entertained. So I guess I'm just having a rough time being by myself all the time. That's understandable. It sounds like you're having difficulty dealing with the feeling of being isolated and getting a new routine can be difficult. And those feelings you're having about your husband should really be addressed directly with him, not by ignoring each other. Thinking about the coping skills you learned in treatment and the support system you have in place, how have you been dealing with these challenges? Uh, to be honest, I haven't really been doing well at all, and I've had some setbacks. I feel pretty bad about it. Okay, Amelia, that's why I'm here. I want to help you through this. Tell me what happened. So over the weekend, the kids went to the zoo with some friends, and David was off golfing, so I decided to take a walk. I ran into one of my friends in the neighborhood, and we decided to go back to her house to catch up for a bit. A few more of the wives from the neighborhood saw us together, and they decided to come over, too. So the next thing you know, we're ordering pizza, and she started making margaritas. They all said that they understand how, I've been, how I'm in recovery, but they just kept saying how one drink isn't going to hurt. So before you knew it, I caved. I've just been so stressed, and I want them to like me. So three drinks later, and I was barely able to get home on my own. By the time the kids got home, they found me asleep on the sofa. Thank goodness they didn't say anything to their father. If David sounds out that I drank, he is going to be furious. I can't stand the thought of him knowing and potentially going back to the way things were. Have you alerted your therapist about what's going on? Actually, I told my therapist yesterday that I'm not coming anymore. I just don't feel like we were going in a good direction. And after our session this week... I've come to the realization that I've made enough progress with her. Our personalities just don't mesh well, and I knew she would react really badly if I took a drink. So I just decided it was best to cut ties. I actually canceled all my upcoming appointments. It's been a difficult week for you. Let's discuss this further and talk about next steps. Okay. All right. So you could hear um, in the recording there some of the challenges that Amelia had started to have. Um, I think it's important to know that, you know, when we followed up with Amelia, this was about eight or nine months after she left treatment. So she had about nine months in recovery at this time. And that's important because one of the things that can be a challenge in addressing relapse is really looking at where they are in recovery. Um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. So um, we're actually going to kind of pull apart some of her experiences and, and tie them in with the relapse process, which um, is one of the things that we look at when we think about relapse treatment. So I did want to take a minute just to differentiate between relapse prevention therapy and relapse treatment. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, really um, 
being aware of kind of where you're at with somebody. So relapse prevention, the goal is to identify and prevent high-risk situations that might lead to relapse. This person has not picked up. They've had a period of sobriety. This is more of a proactive approach. And we think about this, what we're really, you know, Taryn Skorsky, who I'm sure you guys are familiar with that name, who recently um, unfortunately passed away, but he has um, done a lot of work around relapse prevention therapy. And, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to train with him and really look at the ways that in active recovery, we can start to um, identify high-risk situations, patterns of behaviors, patterns of reacting that may lead to an actualization of substance use. In this case, though, I want to make a clear differentiation between what relapse treatment is. So relapse treatment is we're doing an autopsy on the recovery process. Um, we're going to go through sort of all of the steps that Terrence Gorski talks about in his relapse cycle. And in treatment at Karen, one of the things we have our relapse patients do is they're going to complete a relapse cycle. So we're going to do that together based on Amelia's story during this time together. Relapse treatment is not about education on disease. If somebody is a true relapse patient, they understand that they have a disease, They've accepted that they've got a substance use disorder. Um, so we're not providing basic education, and, and in some cases, not even basic education about what recovery looks like, what a 12-step program, Smart Recovery, Celebrate, She Recovers, right? All the recovery programs that we refer people to, we're not even necessarily providing a, a lot of education around those things. What we might look more at is application of recovery principles and programs. In relapse treatment, we're looking to address the underlying issues um, that may have gotten in the way of long-term recovery or long-term sobriety. And so what we find is a lot of our patients who come in for relapse treatment have either unresolved or unaddressed trauma or family of origin issues. Um, many of our patients will have addiction interactions, so they might have a co-occurring um, compulsive behavior work sex, gambling, exercise, right? And so in relapse treatment, what we're looking at is how does, how does the substance use and those other behaviors dovetail together, feed off of each other, replace each other? Um, so we're looking at some of those other pieces. In relapse treatment, we're looking for, um, you know, in the program we talk about how, the honesty of mindset and willingness, but in relapse treatment, one of the things that's really different is being able to be challenged by their peers. Um, so one of the things that we've really tried to look at in relapse treatment is, you know, you might have a group of, of women who have had, you know, anywhere from nine months to 25 years sober. And so their ability to kind of challenge each other, reach out and ask for help, um, um, be honest and make those connections, it's, it's much different than running your primary group, right? So to receive actual relapse treatment, there has to be a willingness to be challenged and to ask for help and to um, have difficult conversations with each other. And then the last part is the family involvement piece. You know, some of our patients who have been chronic relapsers, they might have been in five, six, 12 treatment facilities and their families are also done. And their families don't need a basic, you know, FEP, family education experience, where we're talking about what addiction is and how it impacts the family, they know how it impacts them. Um, and so being able to, you know, kind of look at, um, look at the family dynamic and also kind of validate for them what this is like. Um, you know, we, we just, I'm gonna divert a minute, we said a really great question come in here. Um, and, you know, looking at with the relapse treatment, the co-occurring piece, if there's an underlying, you know, uh, mental health piece or underlying um, trauma component or eating disorder or other addiction interaction, what we know and, you know, sort of, I think what the research has told us over time is the most effective way to kind of treat these two issues is, is together. And we see a lot of our relapse patients coming in with depression, anxiety, trauma, um, family of origin pieces. And what we have found is that, 
you know, in order to address any of these other pieces, we do need to be able to help them, A, develop some other coping skills besides substance use. And we also need to give their kind of brains time to heal and time to regulate. So really, the abstinence piece, the recovery tools, but then also addressing the co-occurring pieces through things like cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, um, through the mindfulness-based stress reduction. You know, a lot of our relapse patients have found that to be very helpful. Um, and even, you know, with the trauma pieces, looking at stabilization with the trauma, helping them to understand that sometimes their responses might look crazy or manipulative, or they might look like they have a mental health disorder, but the truth is some of the responses that our ladies have had are truly survival skills. That is the way that they have gotten through life. <clears throat> so, you know, I think in terms of recommendations, if we can address both of them at the same time, that's the most ideal way to kind of work through these things. Um, so I guess that's all I really want to say about the differences between relapse prevention and relapse treatment. So I want to be really clear that what we're going to be talking about moving forward is treating chronic relapse patients. <clears throat> so if we think about what is relapse, right? So one of the things that, you know, especially in 12-step recovery that we hear a lot is it's just part of the process. And I have really encouraged our patients to consider that it doesn't have to be part of the process. Um, for some people, it is what motivates them. They, you know, we, we say a lot, right, especially in primary care, um, they're going to have to do some more research. But I think in some ways when we present it that way, it almost leaves an out for people. So, you know, what we'll talk about is um, it doesn't have to be part of the process. Um, yeah, great, right? So, so it, 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 it can be a reality, but it's not a requirement, right? I love the way that you just said that. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at relapse, so some like the, the definitions, right, in dictionaries, the act or an instance of backsliding, worsening, or subsiding. And if we look at it from a medical perspective, a reoccurrence of symptoms of a disease after a period of improvement. And I think that it's really important that we, you know, um, reduce some of the shame around people needing treatment after relapse. Because for some people, it's like, well, I've, I've just, you know, wiped away a decade of recovery. Um, and one of the things that we talk about a lot with our patients is that if you've had a period of sobriety, you were doing something right. And so let's take a step back and look at what were the things you were doing right also, not to sugarcoat it and not to look at it through rose-colored glasses, but the reality is, is, you know, our patients who have had periods of sobriety, they've been able to engage with some sort of recovery system. They've had an experience of increase in ability to tolerate emotions, to tolerate difficult conversations, difficult relationships. So to start to build on those things. Um, some people look at relapse as just a return to substance use, but what I want to talk through is um, how we can start to look at recovery as progressive, clear early warning signs. And that's what Terrence Sporsky really talks about when he talks about um, what relapse is. And it's interesting, you know, if you sit with somebody and you would say to them, you know, what is relapse to you? Some people are going to say, well, as long as I don't go back to the Coke, the booze is okay. Some people are going to say no substance use at all. Some people are going to say, I don't know, I guess when I pick up. And we need to also be aware of what our beliefs are about relapse. You know, <clears throat> the NA book has a whole chapter about relapse and recovery. And one of the things that I always tell people when they come in, and it's a direct quote from the NA book and part of my language, but it says, you can't save your ass and face at the same time. And so our relapse patients come in with so much shame that, especially if they're coming back into the same treatment facility, you know, Karen, we have relapse units, and we've had patients that have come back two times, three times. And our discussion then becomes, A, so glad you made it back. It's better than the alternative. But then the other discussion that we need to have with patients who are chronic relapsers is, how have we become part of their enabling system? 
And that's a really difficult conversation to have with somebody who trusts the treatment team, who trusts the facility, knows the rules, knows the expectations. Um, and so some of my most difficult conversations with relapse patients have been, you know, this is like a warm place for you to land. And, and we need you to go somewhere else. We need to try something different. Um, but there's also like a sense of desperation with relapse patients that you don't always see uh, with primary patients. So that's my little spiel on relapse. I think that we need to be <clears throat> especially careful about how we approach this when people come back into treatment. Um, I'm a huge fan that scare tactics don't work. Um, if it did, we would just have like drive through rehab where we tell you're going to die and then you're going to get sober. That doesn't work. But what we do need to do is look at what the relapse process looks like. Caitlin, if you can move to the next slide. All right. So for some of you, this is going to look really familiar. Okay. So this is Terrence Gorski the old pool relapse process that I love and that all of our patients who come into our relapse units do this. And it's very interesting to me because I'll have patients who say, well, I'm a chronic relapser. And my response is often, you've never been in recovery. So there's a big difference between somebody who um, is unable to maintain a period of sobriety over and over and over again versus someone who's like a true, I say true relapse patient. So this first, bubble on here is a commitment to stabilize, okay? And what this means is this is somebody who's had six, eight, eight nine um, uh, months of sobriety. This isn't somebody who says, I've been in 30 days of rehab and I'm, you know, I've committed a commitment to stabilize and I'm in recovery. This is the person who has truly had nine months of, of recovery. They have become, um, willing to take on the emotional sobriety piece that it's not just about physical abstinence. This is a person who is looking at emotional sobriety, is doing their 10th step at night, um, is actively tolerating their discomfort. So I make that differentiation because a lot of our patients will say, you know, they'll come in and, and, and they'll, they'll want to look at a relapse process and I'm like, but you haven't had one because you haven't had a true period of recovery. And that sounds harsh and it sounds mean, but when we actually talk this through, you're going to see how this comes up. So after a commitment to stabilize, there's utilization of the program, a program of recovery. Now, um, Karen Skorsky relies heavily on 12-step recovery. I really have worked hard not to engage in the, dis the dispute or the dialogue or any of those things with our patients about the efficacy of 12-step recovery. What I ask them is, what was your program of recovery that you were using? Was it church? Was it support system? Was it She Recovers? Women for Women, right? What did it look like? And when we're looking at this, this doesn't just say I attended meetings. This says I utilized a program of recovery. And when I talk to chronic relapse patients, they will tell me the first thing that goes is their program. Whether it's they're not going to women's meetings anymore, whether it's other things have begun to take a priority. And this is one of the things that's really unique for women. Um, women in early recovery, there's like this sense of urgency about building a support system, about getting to meetings, about, um, you know, balance and wellness. But for moms, especially when the kids got a soccer game at the same time that my home group is, when, um, you know, there's the child needs to be picked up from school or, um, you know, how, how am I going to manage dinner and work and recovery and my kids and all these things, right? So this is where we really start to do some of this, this work around their own self-worth. They begin to value themselves enough that, you know, I kind of got to put my oxygen mask on before someone else's. The other thing that I really talk with our women about with this utilizing a recovery, a program of recovery is this is when you begin to be aware of my judgments about other people. This is where, you know, they're reading how it works and they're like, rarely have we seen? And I'm like doing my grocery list for tomorrow. Or Susie starts talking and I can't hear Susie talk one more time about her partner and I check out. Um, these are the things I encourage people to be aware of because when we're talking about utilizing a program, this is like I'm all in right? I'm actually 
attentive to it and I've got this going. So this is usually like if we had to put a time on this, you know, this is usually the first three months, right? I'm committed to stabilize. I'm using a program. I'm actively engaged in it. I'm tolerating my emotions. And then what happens is, you know, when I say this to our relapse patients, I'll say, then this I'm cured thought comes in. They're like, well, Aaron, I've never said I'm cured. I know I have disease. I am cured is not like, oh, good thing I got over that period of my life. I am cured is things like, um, recovery becomes less important. Um, you know, this is where women start to compare out. Um, you know, thank God I'm not like this person who did that thing. Um, this is where recovery can take a backseat to other um, priorities, right? And once that happens, and in some ways for women more so than men, and again, like, please hear me, I know that this stuff happens for men, but having worked with the women on the relapse unit, these are common themes that I hear, right? They'll start to say things like, um, my family even says things to me like, well, look, you've been doing this for like, you know, 90 days now. Like, you don't actually have to do it every day, right? Um, and you can start to hear how um, even externally, recovery becomes less of a priority. And once recovery is less of a priority, you stop growing. And stop growing is often connected to um, you know, this increase in confidence that people have in recovery, which we want, right? But what we, what we need to be careful of is when um, ego starts to say, I don't need all these supports, that I, I, I'm, I don't need the program. You know, we heard it with Amelia, right? Like, I don't need this therapist because I've gone as far as I can go with her. Um, we hear this with our relapse patients where they'll say, you know, well, I didn't feel like my sponsor was doing it, like taking me through the steps, right? Or I felt like I outgrew her. Um, so this stopping growing is, is about spiritual growth. It's about relationships. It's about emotional sobriety and emotional growth. Um, and we, and again, you know, if we go back to Amelia's story, we heard this, how this happened for her so quickly and in such a, um, sort of, um, like quiet way, right? Um, so then what tends to happen is people return to old thinking. Um, and we could hear this with Amelia, you know, um, with the uh, thoughts around isolation, with the thoughts around, um, is my husband, is David still having the affair? Um, this can be when we get resentful. Um, this can be, you know, my partner agrees not to drink around me for a period of time, and now they've returned to drinking. So, you know, they're not on my team. Um, you know, we're growing at different rates. Um, maybe it wasn't that bad. This is thoughts that people have, right? Especially as we get further away from that last um, use of substance. Um, so we have this return to old thinking. Um, this can also be when sort of that self-pity starts to creep in a little bit. Like we think about Amelia and she's got this um, community of women who get together on the weekends. And it starts to be like, well, why can't I do that, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, the saying in AA, right, pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. But this is where this can start to creep in. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting that we talk with, that the women um, will say when they come back into treatment, you know, I always make this analogy because, you know, people are like, well, I don't want other people not to have to drink or use around me. And I make the analogy to them. If you are getting chemotherapy and radiation for lung cancer, and I lit up a cigarette next to you, would you ask me to put the cigarette out? Most people are going to say yes. So I encourage people to manage their early recovery with the same delicacy you would if you were receiving chemotherapy for lung cancer. But what happens with the old thinking is it wasn't that bad. I don't want to put other people out. Um, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. So looking at Again, especially for women, how do we keep ourselves a priority and how do we help these ladies to, you know, practice assertiveness and practice, like, I always feel like my dream for women is being an assertive recovery, recovering woman, right? <clears throat> so we have these return to old thinking patterns. And then I start to have stress problems. Because, again, it could be that family is putting external pressures on me. They're the ones saying, like, you know, do you really need to go into meetings so much? Um, this is where we start to 
see a shift for women from um, being primarily with their recovering friends, right? Going to meetings, utilizing the recovery program, going for the walk with recovering people, going to, you know, recovery yoga. And we start to see some um, going back to old relationships that, you know, um, may have been supportive or may not have, or they may have said, I'm not going to drink around you. And then, you know, kind of it slowly creeps in. The other thing that's really interesting for women, again, specifically that, that we talk about all the time, and I think it's important to talk about with women in the recovery process, is looking at how their hormones play into this. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, obviously we think about, you know, menopause and, and change of life and things like that, but there's also some pretty significant hormonal changes that happen like late 20s. And really, how are we preparing people for this? How are we preparing them, you know, if they're, if they're going to have children and they're going to have, you know, hormones related to that? Um, some of these stressors are things that we can be proactive about in helping them to manage. So you can have a return to old behavior. Um, this is, you know, when we think about um, recovery, this is where recovery can start to feel a little monotonous, right? Um, so, you know, for our folks that have addiction or action disorders, this is where they might start um, over-exercising. You know, thinking about Amelia, this might be a, a time where she gets more restrictive with her eating and her exercising, especially because there's this um, stress or this, this old thinking pattern around David and this affair and, you know, kind of feeling um, isolated, right, and alone. So we want to look at what are those old behaviors? Um, this is also a time, you know, again, because this is specific for women, looking at, you know, for a period of time, I might not go to the grocery store that's got the wine aisle in it, but now it's just more convenient and I'm rushed. And it's been so long since I've used, I can probably go back to that, that, that grocery store. So we see this resurgence of old behaviors. And then we, um, be, as a result, right, because like nobody kind of really knows what's going on. Um, there's nobody that I'm truly honest with. I start to isolate. And one of the things that I talk about with our women is that isolation can be real. It can be that I'm all by myself or I can be sitting in a room full of people and feel totally alone, right? Um, and for many people who are kind of in this process, it can be really scary. And we go back to why don't women come into treatment? Fear, shame, lack of trust. These things start to come back up. When we think about old thinking, uh, old thinking patterns, old behavioral patterns that then cause this isolation, I can't trust anybody. They're going to judge me. And nobody can know that I'm struggling again, right? We hear this in Amelia's story. We hear that if David knows that I'm struggling or that I've used again, he's going to leave me, right? So women start to feel paralyzed and kind of trapped in that. Um, back to people, places, and things, right? This is, we hear Amelia's story. She's out walking and, you know, one of the old neighbors comes back up. Um, and so, you know, we're just going to go over and even though they know she can't drink and they know she's been to rehab and there's a threat there, right? Um, from David, we go back to these old people, places, and things. And one of the things I really challenge women to look at is, is often they can identify their people and places, right? And sometimes it's like, you know, I drank after I took the kids to school or I drank after the kids were in bed. But I also encourage them to look at what are their things. Um, and again, for the women, they'll specifically say things like, you know, my um, fine china for my wedding, that I don't want to get rid of the, gla the champagne glasses we drank out of. Um, they know where their wine o o o cork is. They will hear, you know, people walking by with Tic Tacs in their pockets, and they go to this place of, like, pill use, right? Um, and also looking at what are some of their, you know, just going back a second, some of the old behaviors. A lot of the young people who are, you know, patients who have relapsed, they'll say to me, I knew I was in trouble because I stopped taking care of my personal hygiene. I stopped getting up and getting dressed in the morning. I stopped showering every day, um, you know, and, and again, that's a specific thing for women, right, is that they may begin to experience this um, lack of self-care. So when we move on, I have um, pain and problems, right? So I start to feel stressed. I might start to have an increase in 
um, physical ailments. Um, I might have an increase in some of my trauma responses or my other co-occurring responses. I'll often talk with the women too who are, who are um, relapse patients is, you know, if we don't talk about our emotional discomfort, like let's go back, right? I don't talk about the return of my old thinking, my stressors, my, be my, my behaviors that are problematic. It's likely going to come out in my body, especially for people with chronic pain conditions which I should have mentioned as part of this, you know, chronic relapse patients, right? Is they have these chronic pain conditions that when they're emotionally out of control, they can't, it comes out in their body. It just does. Um, and so we start to see this increase in pain and problems. We start to see this resuming of um, addictive, addictive thinking. And I think it's important that when we're working with people, we're telling them like, what does this sound like, right? Um, because, you know, I've heard lots of therapists say, left your addict talking, and the patient's kind of like, what do you mean by that? But our relapse patients, they, they have a sense about what that means. Um, this might be, um, you know, our, our thought that we're not good enough. This might be where we start to forget those daily self-care things that we really look at. So for women, it might be, um, you know, Maybe once a week, I was going for a walk, I was doing yoga, I was allowing myself to take a long, hot shower. And when we start to develop addictive thinking, we start to think, well, I'm not good enough for that, or that's not important anymore. Um, and then, you know, if we think about Amelia, with her kids going back to school, you know, in, in her first segment, she talked about, my purpose is my kids. And so... Um, with them going back into school, we can see how this plays out for her, right? Like, what is my role going to be? How am I going to fill my time? Um, you know, that's something that we see with our women when their kids go off to school, um, you know, when their kids get married. And it's like, what is my purpose? And then, of course, we have high-risk situations, loss of control. Um, and then, actually, the, the return to substance use occurs at that point. So, <clears throat> You know, when we think about this, especially outpatient, if we have folks who have had periods of sobriety or periods of um, recovery, we want to start to help them take a look at this. I have been, you know, doing this since 2004, and uh, I had a really interesting experience on our Grandview program earlier this month where this person who had had long-term sobriety said, I didn't experience this. And we talked it through, and she was like, oh, my gosh, this is like my life, right? So if somebody is truly a relapse person, they need relapse treatment, I promise you they have touched every one of these bubbles. I have seen it without fail. Um, and one of the things that, you know, is interesting and, and that I encourage our folks to do then is look at how do I intervene on these when they're happening? Um, you know, and it's like really simple stuff, right? We always, we talk a lot with folks like you're in a relapse process. Um, you're in a relapse process. And our patients don't understand that. So the example that I use in treatment, I come to treatment, I'm ready to get help, I'm following the rules. Um, but then all of a sudden, I think it's silly that you only get a half an hour for lunch and who eats lunch in a half an hour? So I've decided that the rule doesn't apply to me, so I stopped growing. So I decide I'm gonna steal the cookie from the dining room. So I go into the dining room with my purse and I steal the cookie and I put the cookie in my purse, right? Old thinking, old behaviors. I go into group, I have a difficult group. Uh, but I know I have that cookie in my closet, right? I go into my room and I eat the cookie by myself and I feel better. And the patients are like, oh my gosh, how does this happen? So this, when we're talking about relapse behaviors, relapse process, I'm bringing it right back to simple stuff. It's a cookie from a dining room. But I think the rule doesn't apply to me. I think I can somehow skirt around it. I'm going to use this cookie the same way I use the bottle that I hid in my boot in my closet, right? And so... We need to be able to be pointing these things out for our patients when it's happening. So I get really passionate about this because the women that I've worked with, they can, I mean, they can just click off stuff on this. However, I am also um, a big proponent of how do we then live in a solution with this, right? So how do we develop the skills to intervene on this? So when I do this group with the patients, there's usually one or two that are like, oh, I have granola in my pocket, or I have, you know, 15 bags of Skittles in my room that I need to give back. So we need to be able to really break this down into day-to-day -day things. Caitlin, if you can move to the next slide. 
So I know that one of the um, questions that we had was, what do we do with this? Right? Like, how do we support people after treatment? And you know, there was another question also about what other resources. And I got to tell you, I really we have relied heavily on Stephanie Covington's work. Um, her, the Women's Way Through the Twelve Steps, the chapters in the back about self relationships. That is like standard. Um, and she talks a lot about the importance of connection in those books. And she talks about the importance of first connecting with yourself. Some of our folks, they don't even know what they like. They don't know what their favorite color is, what kind of movie, music. They rely so heavily on other people that we really need to help them to take a look at how do I have a relationship with myself so that I can have relationships with other people. Um, we certainly recommend early recovery groups, women recovery, strong individual therapists. I would say for relapse patients, um, there are really fantastic relapse-focused outpatients that for our relapse patients, always our preference. We have found that traditional IOP might not be the best choice for these folks because the reality is, you know, I remember I, when I was early in my career, I had a relapsed woman who said to me, I've been sober longer than you've been alive. And I was like, all right, that's fair. So, you know, one of the things in working with relapsed patients is knowing that they will easily slip into a therapist role. They will easily slip into the caretaking role, right? So being able to have them with other people who have had recovery, that they don't need basic education, but we're really digging in those things. Family therapy and support of course. And then also, I'm such a huge fan of monitoring, coaching, checking in. That's why the, my first year of recovery program has been really successful. Even some of the work that coaches are doing outside outpatient level, um, you know, really helpful for these patients. Um, so the book is um, The Women's Way Through the 12 Steps by Stephanie Covington. They have um, both a workbook and it's basically like, I describe it as like, the big book for women um, with lots of the stories, but it breaks the steps down really specifically for women. Like powerlessness is very tough for women, right? Because, you know, we've been told we're powerless and um, looking at more as a surrender process and acceptance process. So I know I threw a ton, ton, ton your way. Um, so Caitlin or Martha, I don't know. I know you guys have some housekeeping things also. Erin, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so we did have some, some questions come in, but yeah. just because of time, um, we will get back to everyone that submitted questions um, that weren't answered during the presentation. Um, and just a reminder for everybody, um, we have a couple of um, webinars coming up next week. So, you guys can join us again on Monday at 2 p.m. And we're gonna address another important topic, pride, passion, and pronouns, understanding the importance and elements of a queer normative treatment environment for the LGBTQ plus community. And then also next Wednesday, our Karen New York webinar series will cover the topic, healthcare heroes, they're helping us, but who is helping them? And both of these presentations will be eligible for social work credits. Um, you guys can visit karen.org backslash webinars anytime for more information and to see our upcoming webinars and to register. And as a reminder, um, anyone can reach out to your local regional resource director at any time for additional information and to get resources in your area, or if you have questions regarding any of the programs at Karen. So thank you again to everyone for joining us and we are wishing you all a great afternoon. Thank you.